Good morning. Happy Friday. Oh. Hope you're having a good day. Have an even better weekend. We're going to continue talking about organic chemistry. And the mantra that we're all going to be chanting this morning a little bit is longest chain, smallest number. And I'll show you why that is the case. It all has to stem from, in organic chemistry, having so many isomers of the same formula. And this is a simple example, but we're going to see lots of them. Both of these compounds are C4H10. <clears throat> an alkane, which is both of what these are, and you, by the way, you recognize that from the A and the ending. An alkane <clears throat> is where you have an alkyl group, one of the building blocks of chemistry with a hydrogen on it. All of the carbons are sp3 and tetrahedral. Sometimes they call this a saturated system. <clears throat> But when you have an isomer, it's the same number of atoms, just a different configuration. So instead of having all four carbons in a chain, like four carbons in a row, if you will, you can actually take one of the end carbons and put it on a middle carbon. This is a methyl group we talked about um, on Wednesday. And instead of having a butyl with a hydrogen butane, you can have a propyl group, which was the C3 group, with a methyl group off it called methylpropane. Um, the N, we're going to see right there, the N refers to the fact that it literally is just a chain of carbons, all right, like a big line of carbons all in a row. And this one is a methylpropane. The methyl group is off the second carbon. So this isomer thing is one of the things that makes OCHEM really weird. And again, my ultimate goal here is that when and if you take organic chemistry, it won't be literally snowed over academically, which literally happened to me, long story short. Here's pentane. A pentyl group is a five carbon group. You put a hydrogen on the end and it's pentane. So like before, N pentane would mean just five carbons in a row. And again, every carbon is tetrahedral. So it's either connected to another carbon with a single bond or it has a hydrogen. But like before, <clears throat> you can take the methyl group, put it off of one of the middle carbons, two methyl butane. But wait. If you count left to right, it looks like this would be the third carbon, one, two, three. So three methyl butane is a name that looks very reasonable. But one of the things we're gonna see in OCHEM, so important, like I stated earlier, is that in addition to recognizing what the longest chain of carbon atoms is, you wanna use the smallest number. So instead of counting left to right, which is what we do in English all the time when we read, you also need to think about what it's gonna be right to left. This molecule is rotating around all the time. So what was left becomes right and right becomes left. If you say 3-methylbutane, it's like me saying, I ain't knowing what's going on. Like, you know what 8 means, but it's not really good English, all right? You shouldn't probably be using it unless you want to protest your... Anyway, no, I'm not going to keep my prophet on there. But anyway, 2-methyl... Pro, two methyl butane, excuse me, that would be the correct number. Smallest number, so two is better than three here, all right? Um, you can also put the methyl groups, you can put two methyl groups on the second one. And again, notice this name. Propane, three carbons, is the longest like chain of carbons. And if you circle that propane, there's one and two methyl groups not in the chain. Hence the name. Oh, uh, so will the branches be small? The branch branches of the chain be short? Always be shorter than the chain itself? Yes, that's right. Well done, Dimitri. The branches, like the methyl groups, should always be shorter than the main group. Yeah. Hexane is a covalently bonded molecule consisting of six carbon atoms and fourteen hydrogen atoms. Each hydrogen atom forms one covalent bond and each carbon atom forms four covalent bonds. These 20 atoms can be rearranged into five different compounds called structural isomers, each having slightly different properties. <coughs> Notice how the boiling points of each isomer changes. Arranging the carbon atoms in a straight chain produces N-hexane. 
Moving the end carbon to the second carbon position and rearranging hydrogens produces two methyl pentane. Sliding the methyl group to the third carbon position produces three methyl pentane. Moving the methyl group to the fourth carbon position appears to make four methyl pentane. But wait, rotating the molecule shows that it's identical to two methyl pentane. Now, adding the end carbon to the second carbon position produces 2,3-dimethylbutane. Moving the methyl group to the second carbon position produces 2,2-dimethylbutane. Sliding both methyl groups to the third carbon position appears to make 3,3-dimethylbutane. But wait again. Rotating the molecule shows it's identical to 2,2-dimethylbutane. These are the five isomers of hexane. So first of all, in this little diagram here, you can see how one formula is going to have lots of different possibilities, and that's one of the strange things. Now, as an aside, in that video, it showed the different boiling points of the compounds. Polarity is affected big time by the structural arrangement of your atoms, and you'll start to see in the next sections how the boiling points, you can kind of make predictions, but it does have to do with polarity, and that's why these are so important. So anyway, as you start having more and more carbons, you start to have more and more possibilities. So having a consistent naming system uh, that works from here and people in England and people in any country in the world, uh, it becomes really important. So <clears throat> let's say that you had a molecule like this and you wanted to name it, all right? That's what we're kind of going to go through here and check out. And again, down here on the bottom, I put again our mantra for this section, longest chain, smallest number, all right? And longest chain means you want to literally, like, circle what the longest line of carbon atoms is. So, for example, what I mean by that is we could just, like, circle these three carbons right here, and it would be some kind of propane, and this is a butyl group right here, so it looks like it could be a butyl propane, but Dimitri summed it up really, really well. You always want to make sure that the longest chain is the longest and the branch pieces are smaller. So sometimes the drawings will lie to you, all right? Like sometimes you'll have like things kind of twisted around, but you always want to try and sense what the longest chain of carbons is. So if you circle one, two, three, four, five, six, you're good to go. And by the way, it does not matter if you went one, two, three, four, five, and you circled this one, that's okay too. There would be equivalent. This is one of the things you start to figure out. Now, once you have these numbers down, especially when you're learning, I highly recommend that you put numbering systems from both left to right and right to left, or both directions, just to make sure you're good. Um, the correct way in this version would be to start on this carbon. So one, two, you'd figure out then that this methyl is a two methyl three, four, five, six, but when you're learning, you should totally double check yourself. Start down here too. So if you started with this carbon of one, one, two, three, four, five, all right, this could also be a five methyl hexane, but again, smallest number is the way to go. The two will win out before the five, and if you circle that many carbons, it's gonna be a hexyl or a hexane. So this kind of summarizes what to do when you have one of these weird names. First of all, find the longest chain. And literally, you can circle it, all right? That's kind of what I still do even to this point. Um, but you want to see how many carbons you can get in this base name, all right? Because it's less things you have to name and stuff like that. So you wouldn't just circle three carbons, which could be a chain. You would want to bend it around and actually get them these six carbons right there. <clears throat> Excuse me. You always want to start numbering the chain uh, from the end. And again, to get that lowest number, you want to, I would recommend starting at both sides and going all the way through. And again, what that means, start here, go one, two, three, four, five, six, but also start down here because sometimes the drawings will be deceiving. One, two, three, four, five, six. So see, you could name this a five methyl as well as a two methyl. But again, smallest number is important. 
And then once you have the numbers in their smallest designations, you put them together alphabetically. So what that means is, let's say we had an ethyl group and a methyl group that wasn't part of our circle chain. Ethyl E would come before methyl M, all right? And you can also, as we'll see, have chloros for chlorines and stuff like that. Put everything in alphabetical order, trying to make things more sensible. Um, do not worry about isopropyl, tert butyl. Those are things you'll see more in uh, the actual organic chemistry class. We're gonna try and keep things simple as much as possible. But again, keep this in the back of your mind, man. Longest <coughs> chain, smallest numbers. Any questions on this? Okay. Um, Here's a molecule that's a lot more convoluted, but again, if you break this down, you're gonna be good. So what you wanna do is you wanna circle what the longest chain of carbon atoms is. And this one has things all over the place, as you can see. So when you think about this long enough, you can actually circle seven carbons, all right? Uh, if you went over this way, it would be six. If you went like right here, it would be five, et cetera, et cetera. But when you get it right, the longest chain would be seven. And seven is a heptyl group. So heptyl as an alkane would be heptane. So those circled carbons then are part of this heptane thing. And you can see now that we have a methyl, a second methyl, a third methyl, and this thing right here, which is an ethyl group, those aren't part of the chain, so we've got to put these in names as well. If you have more than one of the same thing, like methyl, you put a Greek prefix before it. So just like we've seen uh, since Chem 221, you could have like a trichloro. This thing here would be a trimethyl. Ethyl comes alphabetically before methyl, so you want to make sure that the ethyl is first. So if you look down here then, ethyl E is before methyl M. If you count from this way up, you have a 2, 4, 5 methyl, and you have a 3 ethyl, so 3 ethyl, 2, 4, 5 trimethyl heptane. Double check yourself though, count from the other direction too. So if this was number one, you'd have a three, four, six trimethyl. You would have a, I believe, a five ethyl. So those numbers would be bigger than the three ethyl, two, four, five trimethyl. So this is how you can start thinking about these things, like how they play together. Yeah. Um, so then uh, you uh, can't think in organic chemistry as a horizontal or vertical because they're mostly tetrahedral. So remember that. So yeah, so think both ways. Think every direction. And sometimes they'll twist and around and stuff. And uh, uh, it's really important that you're very flexible in your thinking of how it is. What I do, at least, is I, I literally, with like a different color, I will try to circle different things. And I go, oh, I got six carbons this way, but I'll do it a different way. Oh, I got seven carbons, so I'll erase the six carbon thing. Yeah, for when you're doing your chain, okay, it's like, um, can your chain only be a chain if it connects to other carbons? Like, is that why you couldn't do the ones in red because it's a dead end? No, the ones in red make shorter chains. So like if you went this way, three, four, five, you'd get that way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, you'd have more pieces like left over that way, so that wouldn't be as cool. Um, the longest chain and shortest number are kind of both of the things you want to come for. But try, try both ways and stuff, definitely, just to see. It's kind of an art, all right? It's not a hard art, and, uh, and by doing these kind of things, you'll hopefully get better so that later on you'll have less of a problem than I had. <laughs> Good question. Other questions? Okay, so here's an organic compound that's something that I might ask you to give me a name for. And again, the mantra, longest chain, smallest number, all right? 
And there's lots of different ways that you can count this, all right? And I'm just gonna go through some possibilities. So you could think, oh yeah, three carbons, longest chain, propane. No, no, no. Because three is smaller than if you went one, two, three, four, all right? So four carbons is the longest. And I circled them all here, like horizontally, going back to Alicia's comment, but really, you could go, one, two, three, four. You could go one, two, three, four. The flexibility is, is something to get used to, absolutely. It's a little weird, man. So any way you wanna count them is totally fine. I'm gonna use the horizontal axis there just because I think that's most familiar. So that once you figure out the longest number of carbon atoms, the smallest number is the next piece. So for example, we've, if this is a four carbon, butyl becomes butane, all right? But you could count left to right, one, two, three, four. So you could call these methyl groups both at the third position. There's two of them, so it's a dimethyl. You could call this compound 3,3-dimethylbutane, and that would be something that people could figure out. But what's wrong with calling it 3 3 dimethyl? It's not the shortest. Yeah, not the short, not the smallest number. Yeah. You can count left to right, but you definitely should count right to left as well. Remember, as long as you're above absolute zero, these things are rotating around in solution. So this could absolutely flip on its axis, and this would become the quote unquote first carbon. So again, this is where you should count both ways. So earlier I went one, two, three, four. Let's also count here, one, two, three, four. And what a lot of you are saying, which is awesome, is you need a two, two dimethyl butane would be better than three, three dimethyl. Smallest numbers, two, two is better than three, three. Longest chain, four carbons in a row, not like three carbs and something like that. Yeah. Um, so, would two dimethylbutane be wrong? Because I thought the di referred to there being two off the two chain. Yeah. So here's the thing. I'm just going to put the carbons up. Uh, this uh, is this is the rough version of what's up there. All right, and you can see it's two two dimethylbutane. The reason why the 2-2 is important to me is because you could also have this dimethylbutane, all right? And on this one, you have a 2 and a 3 dimethylbutane. So the numbers are important. It says explicitly like where they go on that longest chain. Excellent question. Excellent question. Yeah. So that would be 2-3? Uh, yes, that's right. This one right here would be 2-3 dimethylbutane. This one right here would be 2-2 two, two dimethylbutane. Right on. Question. One, two, three, four. Here's my methane. Methyl. One, two, dimethylbutane? Yeah, what's wrong with this, man? Yeah, this is no longer a butane. Check this out. This feels like it should be one, two, dimethylbutane. But wait, like the guy in the video. I can circle now five carbons. This is no longer, like Joseph saw, this is no longer a butane. My longest chain now is five carbons. Five carbons is a pentane. So this compound, either left to right, one, two, three, this compound is a three methyl pentane. Be careful if you see one methyls. That a lot of times is a danger zone that something's wrong with the name. So yeah. So, 2,2-dimethyl, two, two 2,3-dimethyl, but there is no 1,2-dimethyl. This would be like a 3-methyl pentane. Questions? Oh, organic chemistry. You don't have to have a longest literal chain of carbon atoms. You can take the ends of the carbons and put them together. 
And one of the problem set problems from problem set two was an example of that. All right, we did some C4H8, and we took the four carbons and put them together. There was also one of the isomers that was like a triangle of carbons with a methyl group off. These guys are alkanes. Everything is tetrahedral sp3, but you don't have as many hydrogens. These compounds are referred to as a cycloalkane. So let's take, for example, if we said, if we knew this was an alkane, a C6H12, six carbon atoms would be a hexyl group, <laughs> all right? But six carbon atoms in a circle is different than six carbons right across. So if you do have a cyclic thing, all right, you put the cyclo part first, all right? Put the cyclo hex, hexyl becomes hex, taking away the YL and A and E. So the longest chain, sometimes this refers to the longest number of carbon atoms in the system, and you don't want to repeat anything. This is cyclopentane, because there's five carbons, cyclopropane, three carbons. Now, look at the formula for cycloalkanes. It's CnH2n. So before, when we had all carbons in a row, all right, the N2 hydrogens were removed to make a connection between them. So you lose a couple of hydrogens. The formula for a regular alkane was CnH2N plus 2. And you lose those extra two hydrogens when you're making a cycloalkane. So here's a funny thing. Cycloalkanes are very reactivity similar to a regular alkane, but they are not isomers. An isomer, you have to have the same number of atoms. And the formula alone is different, so you're going to have some differences kind of to see what's happening. So for example, then, if you had like cyclohexane, it would be C6H12, while hexane would be N2N plus 2, it would be C6H14. The names are similar, but they are not isomers of each other. Yeah. So would each individual one um, have a pi bond? Is that why it's reactive? Pi bonds are. Pi bonds, uh, Esther, are only for double bonds, and we don't have any double bonds at this point. These are all tetrahedral sp3 single bonds, yeah. Um, if you see the A and E ending, then it's, it's literally all just sig sigma single bonds, all right? Um, they're not necessarily more reactive, but they do have different properties, different reactivity properties. But um, you'll see that the pi bond opens up a whole new like avenue of reactivity that these guys don't have. So Good call. If I see cyclo and A and E, I know it's a closed circuit with just like a full array of hydrogen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The carbons are in a circuit. I like that term actually. That's really cool. They're in a circuit, and every position is a single bond, no, no pi bonds at this point. Good. So. This is a list we looked at a little bit on uh, Wednesday. I'd like you to tell me which one of these could be a cycloalkane. Now on Wednesday, we saw that answer three was an alkane because for every N carbons, we had two N plus two hydrogens. So 14 times two, 28 plus two, that would be some kind of an alkane. But this is not a cycloalkane because the formula is different, all right? Now, C2H4 has the right generic formula, all right? Like if N is two, then two times N would be four. But I'll let you know right now, C2H4 is not the answer here. Why is C2H4 not a? Uh, because it's more linear. It's, more, yeah. It has only two atoms. It has only two atoms. It's more linear. That's right. If you have just two atoms, you can't make a chain. All right. You can make a line, but you can't make a chain. To have a chain, you have to have at least three. So C2H4 has the right formula, but that's something else we're going to talk about in a little bit. So which one of these up here could be a cycloalkane? B. B, that's right, the second one, C5H10, all right? That one has N carbons, five carbons, five times two, 10. This one absolutely could be a cycloalkane. But that first one would be too small. You have to have at least three to make like a chain around it, so. Is that 
the largest cyclo out there? The problem after a while, Tammy, becomes getting the ends to mix together. So it's like, have you ever seen like people doing those rumba dances and they're in a big line? And then sometimes it gets hard for the beginning to do the ending kind of thing. Um, I have seen, I think I've seen some up to like 20, but uh, after that, I think it's just hard to get them together. It's not, reactivity-wise, they should go together, but it's just hard to coordinate. I'm not an expert on cycloalkanes. You might want to Google that answer. So. Good question. Yeah. Sorry, just to backtrack and double check, just uh -huh. to be sure. Um, when we are naming these things, um, the first number position is going to refer to the position that the chain is in, or the, the outer suborbitals are in, and then the second number is going to refer to the number of suborbitals on that outside. Okay, we're not really talking about orbitals here. But the numbers, uh, I think you're what you're talking about. No, 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 you correct me if I'm wrong too, man. Um, if you see numbers, it's like parts that aren't on this chain. Okay, is that cool? Yeah, so um, uh, here's, you could have. This is a quick and dirty way to write a cycloalkane, right? Six carbons in a row. You could have like CH3s up here. This would be like a one, two dimethyl cyclohexane, something like that. Yeah. Is that, did that answer yes, your question? Yeah. Good, okay, cool. Yeah, 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 no problem. Ask those kind of questions, man. I want you to do that. Okay. Oh, there's more. Alkyl halides, all right, are another kind of a family. So far, we've looked at just single bonds, and Esther, we'll come back to your pythons a little bit, I trust you, man, but for right now, yeah, we've looked at just single bonds, carbons, and hydrogens. You don't have to have just hydrogens. Honestly, hydrogen's kind of boring. Those are mostly fuels. If you take off a hydrogen and you put a halogen on there, usually chlorine, bromine, iodine, but sometimes fluorine if you want to live, live, uh, live on the edge. Um, anyway, those guys also go on there. Halogens, honestly, are more Reacting, reactive, excuse me. So for an example, methyl iodide is one name for CH3I. It's a methyl group with an iodine on there. But these guys have two possible names, and I'm really sorry, I'm just the messenger here, I didn't make these rules. CH4 is methane. So sometimes you'll, you'll see this referred to as excuse me, iodomethane. It's an iodine on the methane. Hydrogen will get kicked out for anything that's there in front of it. Iodomethane is another, is another name. Um, here's another possibility, all right? The iodine is on the second of three carbons, going kind of back to what Garrett was asking me about earlier. So we have to tell everybody that the iodine is on the second carbon. This is, also, this is called 2-iodopropane, sometimes 2-propyl iodide, and there's lots of different variations. It doesn't have to be iodine, you can have bromine or fluorine or chlorine or any of these kind of things. Lots of possibilities. These guys are more interesting chemically than the alkanes and the cycloalkanes. Most of the, most of the alkanes and cycloalkanes, they're fuels, like our Bunsen burner gas. That's really what they're good for. Octane in your gasoline-powered car is an alkane. But these guys, you can start to do some interesting kind of chemistry. One of the most famous of all of these is chloroform. <laughs> and it, chloroform, this is a silly joke, chloroform is, has often been used in movies. They put it over someone's face and go, oh, all right, and men and women, not just, okay. Anyway, prop that back on. Uh, so anyway, does this rag smell like chloroform? They're trying to knock you out. All right. Anyway, chloroform is a name for another one of these alkyl halides. It's a trichloro, trichloromethane. But just like no one calls water dihydrogen monoxide, except for nerdy chemists, all right, hardly anybody calls chloroform trichloromethane, except for nerdy chemists. So I'm trying to introduce some of these things that you may have heard of before from a more chemical perspective. Uh, yeah. What's bonded to those chlorines? You only have one bond on it. It's not important, I guess. Yeah. Um, this is another tetrahedral sp3 carbon, Joseph, and carbon with four bonds. One of them is a hydrogen, and the other three are just single bonds to chlorine. Yeah. The chlorines that have lone pairs around them, you could draw a Lewis structure or stuff like that. Good question. 
About this time, if you're 21 in the United States and 19 in Canada, you might be tempted to look into the alcohol. <laughs> now that's a dumb joke. Alcohol, drinking alcohol is actually one of this. In the chemistry world, drinking alcohol is just one type of alcohol. So just like there's a class of families that are alkanes and cycloalkanes, there's a class of families that are alcohols. So in my world, alcohol is more than just Everclear on a Friday night, shall we say. So anyway, <laughs> just so you know, alcohols are an alkyl group with an OH on the end of them. OH is a real active part of chemistry. We're gonna see some examples of this. Alcohols are great ways to make other kinds of compounds. Now, drinking alcohol, if you're 21 and over or 19 in Canada, drinking alcohol is an ethyl group with an OH on the end. So we took off the one hydrogen there on ethane and we put the alcohol part in there. This compound is called ethanol. And there's only one place that the OH can be. Like if we put it on this carbon, but we rotated it, it would be the same molecule. So ethanol is literally an OH off that middle one right there. Um, it's good for, in addition to all of the uh, uh, bad uses of genos, shall we say, ethanol is also a really good solvent. It's really good about cleaning some types of uh, machinery. Notice the formula. The formula for an alcohol, CnH2n plus 2, and that looks like an alkane, but there's also an oxygen. All right, alcohols have one oxygen on them, which makes them a little bit different. Um, when you get to the bigger alcohols, propanol is an example of uh, when you start to have to think about numbers. Now, propanol is a three-carbon system, all right? And in a three-carbon system, if you put that OH on the end, you now have to think about the numbers because if you put the OH on the end or you put it in the middle, now you have an isomer. You can't rotate that into the other one. Traditionally, this compound has been called 1-propanol. So the OH group is off the first carbon. It might look like it's the third carbon, but remember, if you rotate it, it's gonna be the same thing. There's a new trend in organic chemistry where sometimes the one is placed in front of the all. So instead of 1-propanol, the new trend is to say propan one all. Uh, I don't like that as much, but this could just show that I'm getting older. <laughs> Heaven forbid. But anyway, uh, we'll see it both ways. Um, most of the time, this one is still dominant, but a lot of the organic chemistry texts now are showing the one right next to the all. And there's some interesting reasons why they're doing that. Conversely, again, you can move that OH to the second carbon. So again, these are isomers of each other. Same formula, C3HAO. But now the OH on this one is on the first carbon. Here it's on the second one. Can't rotate one to the other. One propanol traditional, two propanol traditional. Here's the new versions of the names. You can write them either way in my class and I'm totally happy with it, all right? Um, you'll see them, like I said, in both, uh, both contexts here. The polarity is different, so your boiling points, melting points, all that kind of stuff is gonna be affected. This compound right here is isopropyl alcohol. If you go to Fred Meyer's or Home Depot, something like that, you can buy a big jug of isopropyl alcohol. Isopropyl is an old school name for 2-propanol, or excuse me, propan 2 all. Yeah, Karen? So then, um, if, for example, we uh, had another OH chain, or branch off the main chain, would that then change, or would it keep the name the same, but only add another? to it, like if it was in the second position as the second one. Yeah, if you have a second OH, it then becomes a diol. And I'll talk about that real fast, Garrett. So hold that thought, man. Really good thought. 
Um, I'm going to introduce this part right here because it's something in organic chemistry that drove me crazy. Sometimes they talk about primary alcohols, secondary alcohols, and tertiary alcohols. And I, it's, we're not going to get into it in this class, but notice that in the primary alcohol, the OH, which is going to see is the exciting part, the carbon with the OH is connected to one carbon. So remember, R is the generic alkyl group. So ethanol, this carbon in the middle is this one right here, and this would be a CH3. So if the OH carbon is connected to one carbon, it's called a primary. On the other hand, a secondary has two carbons connected to that COH. And you do sometimes run into tertiary, which is a carbon right there with three carbons around. So you have a, if you had another methyl group right there. We're not gonna worry about that in Chem 222, but I am introducing it because it does become important in the regular chemistry class. So before we talk about diols, let's see if we can name this bad boy, all right? This is a compound and stuff with a name, all right? Just like before, longest chain, smallest number, but we also have to think about now what kind of compound it is. So is this an alkane or an alcohol? Let's get that part out of the way. Alcohol. Alcohol, all right? And you know it because of the OH, all right? The OH makes an alkane into an alcohol. If that was a hydrogen like we drew up here earlier, then that would be an alkane. Longest chain, any way you count it, four carbon atoms. If it was an alkane, it would be butane, but because it's an alcohol, all right, it's gonna get the OH name on it. So the question is then, if this is a type of butanol, is there a choice where the OH goes? And the answer is absolutely, because you have the OH on the second carbon right now, you could have it over here on the first carbon, um, you could have it on one of these over here. So we need a numbering system for where the alcohol is. And again, this is where you should think about smallest number. If you count left to right, the alcohol, one, two, three. So one possible name here would be butan three all. But starting right to left, one, two, this is also butan two all. Longest chain, smallest numbers, call it by, uh, call it with a two. Yeah. So the two just means how, like where it's placed, it doesn't mean like how many OHs are on the that's right. The OH, oxygen, is also sp3 tetrahedral. So that oxygen will have two lone pairs. One bond is connected to hydrogen, and the other one will connect to the carbon. And that's the one you want to use the number for. That's right. So in this four carbon butane turned butanol, the OH is off the second carbon. Yeah, perfect. Another question. A diol is what Garrett asked about earlier, and that's a really good thing. Now, a diol is just an alka some kind of a alkane, essentially, but it has two OHs, and these are actually pretty common. Um, ethylene glycol and propylene glycol are used a lot in car uh, radiators and stuff like that. Um, those, again, just examples of when you have two OHs off the same thing. So like dimethyl, we saw earlier when we had two methyls, this is a diol. So ethylene glycol is the common name for what is really ethane 1,2-diol. This is how they name them. They start with the alkane and then they go with this numbering system diol. This crazy thing over here, propane 1,2-diol, it's got three carbons on it with two OHs. Don't expect to see a lot of diols or triols, as we'll see in a little bit for me, but again, I want you to know it, and I want you to recognize that propyl propylene glycol and ethylene glycol, if you see them at Fred Myers, you can name them. We can have an, we can have an isomer for the pro for propane 1,3-diol? Uh, yes, that's right. You can even have one for the ethylene glycol, Dimitri. You could have a 1,1-diol one, one stuff. Oh. So the numbering is important in both cases. Yeah, Sergio. Would that mean that their boiling points would be different? Yes, big time difference. That's right. The OHs we're going to see have a huge spike in the boiling and melting points, and we'll see that in the next section. Yes? You didn't write it this new way. How would it be written? Like, where would that dial? 
Um, so in the old ways, it was like propan number all, all right? I, I haven't seen that with this kind of thing because there's not one alcohol, there's two of them. Um, but on the other hand, this stuff keeps changing and maybe I'm not aware of it. So I've only seen diols and triols, as we'll see in the next slide, listed this way, but if you see them, then you let me know. Yeah. I'm a metal guy, prop that off, all right? Will Slater, no, I, I used to use like chromium and molybdenum and tungsten, so this stuff is like, oh! But it's really important. I don't want you getting wiped out in organic chemistry. I was talking to my eye doctor the other day, he said, oh, organic chemistry really shot me down. I don't want to hear that from you, <laughs> all right? I'm trying to protect you, man. So we're going through the O-chem stuff, learning. Prop that back on, it's important stuff. Question. <laughs> I've had a lot of caffeine this morning. Okay, there's also a triol, like I was babbling about. Glycerol is the most common of the triols. And again, glycerol is just nothing more than this thing right here. So it's a triol, three alcohols, one, two, three. And this particular one has one OH per carbon. So again, I've only seen this, back to ZZCOM, I've only seen this one too, it's propane one, two, three triol. But again, no one hardly calls it that. They'll call it glycerol, or what's even more common sometimes, glycerin, which is the same thing. So the common names dominate, just like water dominates as a common name versus dihydrogen and oxide. Yeah. And really quickly, that, uh, besides the numbering, that name would change if you had, uh, say, two branches in the second position rather than one, two, three. It would just be one, yeah. two, two. You would have like a one, two, two or something like that. That's right. Yeah. It would still be the same name, though. That's right. Okay. That's right. The numbers are so important in organic chemistry to tell you where they are. Good call. Ethers, though, are another thing that's really important. Now, first of all, let's look at the generic formula right there. CnH2n plus 2 with an O. Same formula as an alcohol. So if you have a formula like C2H6O, you don't really know if it's an alcohol with the OH or it's an ether. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Instead of having an OH on your, on your carbons, ethers have an oxygen between two carbons. So it's like they pulled the hydrogen off, and I think as I saw in Alicia, uh, all these oxygens are sp3, so they need like two bonds on them. But in an alcohol, one of those bonds is to hydrogen. In an ether, both oxygen bonds are connected to carbons, all right? The most common of all the ethers by far is this one right here. Now there's a couple different ways, big surprise to say it. The classic way is to call it dialkyl ether. So in this particular example, this is an ethyl group and this is another ethyl group. So the common way to call this, I would say, diethyl ether. And sometimes when people are using this, they will just call it ether. Diethyl ether is by far the most common. It used to be you could buy diethyl ether at Fred Meyer's. Now, thanks to the meth epidemic, it's a controlled substance. And we can get it here at Mount Hood because we have the academic license or whatever, but you can't usually just go buy it. It's something that's really controlled. It's one of the precursors for some of these drugs and stuff like that. Now, when I first started teaching OCHEM, this was the only thing I did with ethers. And my students came back and said, whoa, Russell, you should really talk about the other way of naming it. And I, I agree. So there's another way to name these crazy things. You take the longest alkyl chain and you give it an alkane name. So in this example, there's an ethyl group and a propyl group. Propyl is longer than ethyl, so propyl becomes a propane. And the other part gets an oxy name. So eth oxy is what this part is, eth oxy propane. And you have a choice, like we've talked about, where that eth oxy goes. So right now, it's on like one of the end carbons, so it's one ethoxy, but you could have an ethoxy off the second one too, that would be a two ethoxy. And again, in the old days, I would have called this ethyl one propyl ether or something like that, because that's easier, but ah, organic chemistry keeps changing like everything. So here's another example of how this works. 
This one is kind of hard to see, but there's one, two, three carbons in a row. And off the second carbon, there's this OCH3, all right? So this one with the new system, this is a methoxy group because it's a methyl group connected to the O. And one, two, three, that would be a propane. So because the methoxy is off the second carbon, two methoxy propane. So ethers are kind of beasts. Um, this is a cup in my office, it's kind of stupid, but this is a generic symbol for an ether. And it says you ether get organic chemistry or you don't <laughs> ether. Okay, I need to get a life, I know. But anyway, you'll get the cup now. Okay, some of you are at least smiling because you're nice. That's cool, but you don't have to smile. Anyway, yeah, it's a stupid organic chemistry joke, but now you'll get it. Bring in humor to the world. Okay. Oh, there's more. So far, all of our bonds have been sp3 tetrahedral, but there's a whole bunch of them that are sp2 trigonal planar. And the first one we're going to look at here is called a ketone. Now, if you have a carbon-oxygen double bond, you have a special group in organic chemistry. And the carbon-oxygen double bond is called a carbonyl. And a carbonyl is much more reactive. Um, Esther brought up the pi bond earlier. This is the first one we've seen with a pi bond. A double bond O has a sigma and a pi, and that pi has a lot of reactivity that the other ones don't. So if you have a carbonyl, a CO, between two alkyl groups, it's called a ketone, all right? And by far the most common of all of the ketones is this one right here. Now this compound, if we were to name it, it's a one, two, three. This would be a propane if it was an alkane, but it's not an alkane because it's a C double bond O. So because the carbonyl, CO, is between two carbons, it's a ketone, propane becomes propanone. Propanone doesn't sound very familiar, Dr. Russell. Ah, you probably all used it. Acetone. In Chem 221, we used acetone to like dry glasser, and we'll use it in Chem 222 as well. Acetone is a real common thing to dry glassware in chemistry. It's also good about taking off fingernail polish if you're uh, into that kind of stuff. That's what they'll usually use to take the old fingernail polish off. So propanone is the fancy name for acetone. And acetone is something you can go buy at Fred Meyers. It's a good drying agent. Okay. Now, ketones, carbonyl, in the middle of carbons. Aldehydes are really similar. It's another carbonyl, but on one side, or in this case two, you're going to have a hydrogen. Hydrogen next to a carbonyl does some wild reactivity things that we're not going to get into right now. So notice the generic representation for an aldehyde up here. R with a COH. The R is the alkyl group with a carbon. Carbon connected to the carbonyl, but the hydrogen on the other side. And note, this is not oxygen connected to the hydrogen. This carbonyl, this CO, that carbon is connected to the hydrogen. So what you do is you think about what the alkane name would be of the aldehyde, and you give it an AL ending. So this one right here is the most common of all the aldehydes. One carbon would be methane, but because it's an aldehyde, a carbonyl next to a hydrogen, methanal, methanal. And methanol's formal and unformal name is formaldehyde. <laughs> the formaldehyde's Lewis structure in problem set number two. <laughs> methanol cost me several points on some quizzes because I thought methanol was the same as methanol, the alcohol with one carbon. Ah, I was wrong. So I'm just letting you know, methanol, methanol, different compounds. They sound really similar. Al is the aldehyde and OL is the alcohol. So, here's another compound. Let's name it. This is the carbonyl, that's C double bond O. If you see a C double bond O, at least so far, it's either gonna be an aldehyde or it's gonna be a ketone. So you can see here there's some names, AL, aldehyde, OL, alcohol, all right, stuff like that. Is this going to be an aldehyde or a ketone? 
ketone. Ketone. Well done. Your carbonyl is between two carbons, all right? If there's carbons on both sides of the carbonyl, it's going to be a ketone. An aldehyde would have a C double bond O, but there would be at least one hydrogen connected to that carbon. So this is a ketone, O-N-E. You can probably guess it's going to be E. Four carbons would be butane, turned into a ketone. Butanone would be the name of this piece. You don't have to specify the location that. Uh, not in this case. When you get to pentanone, you can have a two pentanone and a three pentanone. But this one you don't have to. Right on. Good. So say if we have a three three bonds and a triple bond, uh -huh. would that mean it's even more reactive since there's two pi bonds? Yeah. The the more pi bonds you have, generally, the more reactive it is. That's right. There's a couple of exceptions, Esther, but I think overall that would be a good thing to state. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we will look more at carbon, carbon, double, and triple bonds on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you on Monday.